Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green. And joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hi. <laughs> resident <laughs> everyman, Sam Schultz. Just hear those sleigh bells ringling, jing, jing, jing. Oh, <laughs> thanks for the <laughs> reminder. I'm crooning. Wow. Uh, what are you getting for your partner this oh. Christmas? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I walked into a trap. <laughs> We're recording this on November 4th, and I don't know. Let me hit you with another one, then. I just went okay. to see James Acaster in Seattle hmm. uh, uh, about a month ago. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was absolute delight. And he talked a lot about like the needs of the sort of five-year-old version of him that lives inside of him still and mm. still has a lot of needs that he has to take care of. So what, if you had a chance, would you buy five-year-old you? For Christmas. This is another Ooh. trap. I still buy a lot of toys and stuff. <laughs> the exact same thing I want now. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sarah, you go first. I'm going to think about it. I also buy the toys that I want. Let me go first. Let me go yeah, first. Yeah, please go first, okay. Hank. Yeah. Because I, here's what I do. You know how you can get like slime, like kids can get slime, and then they put their hands in and they play with it? Yeah. I want that, but I want like at least five gallons. <laughs> I think that the amount of slime that you get is like by far not enough. Uh-huh. I want to be able to like sink my whole head into the slime. I want to, I want to so like dangerous. put my arms in it. I want to like, yeah. like a whir- I want to go outside and just like be a slime monster. I want to put it over my, you know, five year old little body and run around. Hank, you want to know what? I was going to also say slime or some kind of goo <laughs> because I, I feel like when you goo. when you grow up you're like if I get the goo it's just gonna get ruined or it's gonna get on my carpet and then my wife's yeah. gonna be pissed when you're yeah. five and I've got a wife to worry about you're gonna be That's slinging right. slime everywhere yeah I wanna like I wanna put slime on me and then get on a bike <laughs> just right around the neighborhood <laughs> I don't I think you both could achieve this dream. Get a kiddie pool, yeah. get a lot of like a big five gallon bucket of Elmer's glue mm, and some yeah. borax. It's true. I bet you could, we could buy a lot it. of slime on Amazon. You could probably subscribe yeah. to slime on Amazon. Like you can subscribe to bottle cap. Slime of the month. Yeah. 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 I, I've actually even have I, I've got like mutuals on TikTok who are slime makers. So I could mm-hmm. just, I could DM them and be like, hey, how much how much I get a, five a bulk gallons. slime discount? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of it's just the packaging process of like yeah. getting it into the little can. Let's skip that step. Send me the bucket. The the postage on that would be insane, though. Well, maybe they'll just put it in their trunk and drive it over. That's a real <laughs> okay, Santa okay. delivering it on Christmas morning, too. So uh-huh. also very exciting for five year old. Yeah, you. it's been tricky for Santa since slime happened because it's so heavy. Uh, <laughs> it's carry and a so lot messy. Of slime. It's it's like, it gets all over that. Everything to do with Santa is made of like crushed velvet, and that does not mix well. That with don't come out. That don't come out. <laughs> no. He has a lot more outfits now than back in the old day, where he just keep rewearing it. Okay, now I'm picturing five year old Sari running around, being happy and cute and inquisitive. Mm-hmm. What does Sari? What does little Sari want? I feel like I would want unlimited time in some sort of like insectarium, like rent a museum for myself, maybe just biosphere too. But if it was oh, wow. safe for yeah. kids, you want like just bio- running yeah. around. You, just, you just want, you want, bio- <laughs> Sarah is, I think my big dream is, is a bucket of slime. And Sarah is like, I want biosphere too. Yeah. I want to do a Polly Shore movie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Five-year-old Sari would just want to run around unattended and mm-hmm. uh, You want a bunch of and, bugs. Yeah, I had so many like paper notebooks that I made where I would walk around our yard and like tape sticks and leaves into it. And so if I could just do that, but with more cool stuff than what mm-hmm. I could find in our yard, I think yeah. I would be happy. I'm so happy for all of our little five-year-old selves. If only mm-hmm. we could get out of childhood free of trauma, I'm sure that none of us would be so... Driven and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we are. We're <laughs> driven. <laughs> All right. Every week here on Tangent, we get together to try to one up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them, will, one of them, will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week. It's from me. 
I like to have a drink sometimes when I'm out with my friends, a couple of beers, a couple of shots to celebrate weekends. But another couple shots from there, I know I've made a mistake. I'm not having fun anymore. My body needs a break. I've got my Uber headed home. It'll be here any minute. The cemeteries are full of folks who didn't know their limit. It's the dose that makes the poison, the quantity that counts. Anything will kill you if you have the right amount. I like to go on Twitter. It's an easy thing to do. (laughs) Open it up and see what fresh hell's waiting there for you. But then I close it down and have breakfast with my wife. Playing Wordle over coffee is a great part of my life. If I didn't take some breaks, I don't know if I'd be alive. That much Twitter all day long, could anyone survive? It's the dose that makes the poison, the quantity that counts. Anything will kill you if you have the right amount. The topic for the day is poison. Up in the air as to whether or not Twitter will still exist by the time this airs. <laughs> <laughs> I may have quit by then. That's, that's yeah. certainly possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, or at least scaled back my presence. So, poison. Uh, am I right, Sari? It's everything as long as you have enough. I would say that anything can be considered you can have toxic amounts of anything. Mm-hmm. I don't know if scientists would look at everything in the world and be like, I would call that a poison. Yeah. yeah. Would they look at Twitter and be like, I would call that a poison? <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Uh, probably. Sociologists specific. say yes. Uh, <laughs> what about a specific substance that interferes with the body's ability to do body stuff? Uh, so, so toxin is the overall thing. And I think it's like interferes with body stuff at relatively small amounts mm-hmm. is, is how I would put it is the amount of the thing needed is relatively small, which is what makes it dangerous and toxic as opposed to mm-hmm. just like a food that we eat or water that we drink mm-hmm. or Twitter that we scroll on. The difference that a lot of people like to draw between um, poison and venom is how they enter your body. So toxin is just like if you want to talk about bad things that are out uh, there things that can harm you nice. in small doses there's always you're always accidentally saying poison or venom when you mean venom or poison but if you say toxin mm-hmm. you're good every time yes nice. that's that's my strategy that's my science communication tip for everyone listening uh <laughs> whenever i'm a little bit unsure i use toxin instead and i'm like i know that's gonna no one's gonna call me out for that i almost texted you guys to be like should we just call this episode toxin because i'm having a hell of a time <laughs> Making money <laughs> about poison. We can make this episode in spirit about toxin. Poison is a sexier word, poison. though. We're oh, gonna okay. keep it poison. Mm. <laughs> How's venom compared to poison and sexy cool scale? Too. Ah, toxin sucks compared to the other. Okay, <laughs> toxin's too technical. Toxin's the nerd version, and then you get poisons poison. and venoms. Venom. So yeah, poison you eat. If you ingest it, then it's poisonous, mm. and venom eats you or is injected somewhere into your body then it's venom so like a sting a bite can be venomous Mm. a berry uh can be poisonous what if i swallow a bee and it stings my tummy i was having the same question earlier uh if a if a bee stung inside your tummy i would still call it a venom because the sting is the method of delivery if it dissolved in your tummy and then you went, oh, I feel sick, oh, then that's a poison. I got bee poisoning. And then there was a, a 2014 paper that I was reading that uh, when, when you get to like the middle zone of poisons and venoms, there are animals that spray. And so mm. it's like, well, you're not quite injecting it. It's not a stinger. It's not a bite. But it's not as mm. passive as poison. Like you're not necessarily being eaten. You're like, you have this poison. That you create, you have this toxin that you create, and are halfway active, but when when it sprays on you, then that's when it absorbs into your skin or something. Ultimately, there is a line here where it gets fuzzy. Also, did they name these two things first, and then later they were like, "Oh, maybe that's kind of the same thing." It feels a little like that to me. It feels a little like we uh, sort of retroactively had to apply definitions to these we things. We already got these two really cool words, though, so we can't yeah. really get rid of <laughs> either of them. get rid of them. Let's they just make up a bullshit words. definition for one of them. Well, they, they kind of had a difference from their, from their root words. So poison comes from potare, which means to drink. And so poison ah. is very in the, in the potion family. Like you drink something and then it's bad for you and then ugh, you de- you're dead. Mm-hmm. It's like a borrowing from French. So I don't know, poisson. I don't speak French. Don't that mean fish? Uh, Isn't one of those words fish? 
It does sound like the fish word. Yeah. Be careful, French people. <laughs> Don't make that fish. mistake. Yeah, poisson. It's fish, fish in French. What is poison in French? Uh, also, they're very similar. It is poison. <laughs> it is just spelled the exact same way. Do I know how to pronounce it? Absolutely not. Poison. 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 <laughs> I thought that was. <laughs> I thought that was Catherine. <laughs> that was, no. I was Catherine standing in there with you, <laughs> just ready. <writing it. laughs> <laughs> She's always here listening to us podcast yeah. live, but only what one a, third of it. <laughs> what a horrible, horrible realization. Uh, <laughs> venom comes from Latin venenum, which is poison. <laughs> uh, so yes, it means something, but then it I think it evolved to something that was secreted by an animal or transferred by biting. Venenum means poison. poison. <laughs> yeah. This is or bullshit. just t- maybe probably means toxin. But probably means talk. Yeah, it probably mean more well, accurately. Have, means yeah, they might not have even sort of understood that a venom was a thing. It was like a snake bite. Like the problem wasn't the thing the snake injected in you. It was the snake, you know? Yeah. Snakes are bad. Things that hurt are like, that's the animal's thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas poison is oftentimes something that people do to people. All right. I feel informed on our topic. We're going to move on now to the quiz portion of our show. And that means we're going to be playing dead or not dead. Uh, it's a special, special <laughs> love, a new tangent scape. I'm going to tell you the name of an animal, and you have to imagine that you are that animal. Then I will be offering you something that might sound potentially appetizing oh. to you as said animal. <laughs> as a catch, though, it could be poison. It's up to you to decide whether or not that meal will leave you dead or not dead. I love this. All right. So you are, for this first one, a black-headed gross beak. A bird found in the western part of North America. Mm-hmm. It, its song has been described by allaboutbirds.org as like a tipsy <laughs> robin welcoming spring. So they're having a good time over there. Yeah, and good. you might migrate okay. down to central Mexico when the weather gets cold. I'm offering you an insect that you might run into on your path south that has distinctive black and orange wings. Would this leave you dead or not dead? Well, black and orange. That seems like the don't eat me color but then there's other guys who pretend to do the don't eat me color so it really is kind of up in the air i think dead i think a gross a gross <laughs> shouldn't be messing with that kind of sit, kind of thing i wouldn't or i won i'd eat a nice bear you logic it all out i i would say as a gross speak i'm i'm brave why am i called oh. a gross speak because you got gross stuff in there in your beak yeah i got gross stuff in there i think Every- it's actually from french for big but i'm just uh, hmm Oh, okay. Well, if I have a big, big beak, I can crunch that bug. I'll crunch it. So um, I'm going to say not dead. The answer is not dead because I offered you a monarch butterfly. I know that's not what you were thinking when you heard orange and black insects, but that is what it is, which is poisonous to many animals thanks to its ability to consume another poison, milkweed. Milkweed is the same type of poison that comes from the poison arrow tree, and it can cause cardiac arrest in humans and animals besides humans. These oh. compounds interfere with the sodium potassium pumps in your muscles. That messes with your heartbeat. But monarch butterflies are able to consume milkweed thanks to a set of mutations that enable the sodium pump to function despite the compounds. And it turns out that the black-headed grosbeak also has a similar set of mutations as do several other monarch butterfly consumers, including the Mexican black-eared deer mouse. This mutation is an example of convergent evolution. It comes in handy for the black-headed gross beak, which eats monarch butterflies as it migrates south. Yeah, so it would kill you, and it's happened in the in the butterfly, and in the bird, and in a mouse. If you ate the bu- if you ate the bird, would you die? Uh, if a human ate a bird that was full, just chock full of butterflies, it's just like the uh, butterflies just gooshing. But the bird out. on it, know, the maybe. bird on its own is not poisonous. Eh? No, no. Okay, I don't okay. think so. But maybe I haven't tried. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not in my list of facts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Round number two. You are a yellow spotted monitor lizard that, lizard that lives in Australia. You are brown with various light colored spots and you live on the ground digging holes to nest in. But you're also great at climbing and you can sprint on your hind legs. And you have long forked bluish tongue that you use to look for prey by sensing odor molecules. This sounds like a grand old time for you. I'm offering you a large brown warty toad that was brought to Australia in the 1930s to help control pests on sugarcane farms, but has unsurprisingly spread beyond the farms. Mm. Would this leave you dead 
or not dead. So Toads, I feel the same way. I, I understand why this game is so hard because there are, there are the guys that are poisonous. Mm-hmm. There are plenty of Toads that ha- have the toxic mucus on, on their outsides. And then there are probably some guys that just pretend to. Or maybe my blue tongue has some sort of anti toxin, anti poison, no, antidote. Blue could be a clue. I'm gonna say die, dead. I'm, <clears throat> I'm, toads don't mess with them. They got these big, like they have a Chad type look to them. They're walking <laughs> around. The toads they're walking the lizards. around. The lizards. <laughs> they're walking around. They're like, oh, delicious lizard. Oh, and then yeah, they're gonna croak. They're gonna eat anything in their path. And these toads are no good for them. They're dead. The answer is dead. As a monitor lizard, it would take you less than 30 seconds of having that toad in your mouth to die. Scientists have reported that 90% of yellow spotted monitors have died in areas that have been taken over by cane toads. That's a bummer. However, Mm -hmm. it turns out that smaller juvenile toads are slightly less poisonous to monitor lizards, a fact that scientists decided to use to see if they could teach monitor lizards to not eat cane toads. So they presented (laughs) young cane toads to monitor lizards via a fishing pole. And when the lizard ate the small toads, they would get a little sick, but not so much to leave permanent damage. And that appeared to be enough to convince the monitor lizards to not give them a a second try. Don't let they got to go tell their friends or something. Well, no, he's got to hit every one of them. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) One at a time, baby toads. That's a wild way to do it. I would think maybe you could like make a meatloaf that looks like a toad and just like make it taste real bad. But no, (laughs) they just find the baby ones. Put them on a fishing pole and and semi poison a lizard. Make a little puppet, a little toad puppet, and go what? Scare the lizard so they yeah. run away. Uh, yeah, uh, that's how I would do it. Round number three, our final round. You are the African crested rat, roughly the size of a rabbit with black and white fur that makes you look kind of like a skunk. Scientists used to think that you lived alone, but it turns out that you're social and you like to purr at your fellow crested rat friends. I'm offering you the bark of a small tree that has broad leaves and berries that taste sweet, but slightly bitter when ripe. Would this leave you dead or not dead? I think we both know the answer to this, don't we? I think we both (laughs) I was going to put on a show for the podcast, Sam. (laughs) What do you 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 know the answer? I thought you were joking. I'm pretty sure this is the thing that makes them poisonous, right? The thing it eats and it grooms itself or something and then the rat is imbued with poison powers. So he's fine. Yeah, this is, is that right? This is definitely the 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 poisonous rodent like that, that that exists. It's very metal, it has spikes. It is poisonous. I don't know what gives it its poison though. A lot of times it's insects like frogs oh. and birds that are poisonous uh get them from insects, but this one could get it from bark. I just feel like you wrote know. an episode of SciShow that I animated about this subject. Is that the case? Probably yes. Yeah. Okay. Because then I <laughs> because but I, then I I've put known that about information this for where a while. the information goes, which yeah. is yeah. to the ether, to yeah. the space uh-huh. between the worlds. Then, then it became a lingering fun fact in my brain. Where yeah, come time for this episode, I was like, I think I know about a poisonous rodent. Oh shoot! Now mm-hmm. I'm doubting myself. I think he's okay though. Yeah. The the bark, it's fine. The answer, indeed, is not dead. In fact, as you were saying, you probably should chew on this bark if you are this rodent, because this is the poison arrow tree, which I mentioned earlier, and it's very toxic to mammals. It can lead to vomiting, difficulty breathing, and cardiac arrest at high doses. It can also be used as heart medicines at lower doses. But you know what's also poisonous? The fur of the African crested rat, because the rat likes to chew on this bark. And when researchers studied the rat in captivity, they watched them take their spit after chewing and apply it to their fur, coating it in the poison. And they hypothesized that the rats are able to tolerate the toxins from the bark because of their four chambered stomachs and all the gut bacteria that can break this uh-huh. stuff down. And then they just wipe the poison on their bodies. Cool. Also, the berries, when ripe, are not poisonous. Only the bark oh. Oh. of the tree, not of the rats. The rats' They're berries so- don't mess with. Well, that means that Sam has two points <laughs> and Sari got all three of those right. Next oh. up, we're going to take a short break. Then it'll be time for the fact. Hello and welcome back, everybody. It's time for the fact off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. 
And after they've presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question for you. Throughout history, people have found ways to repurpose poisons into medicine, like Botox, for example, which is made from a toxin produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. The toxin is responsible for botulism, which is very bad and dangerous, and it targets nerves and can lead to paralysis and death. Clostridium botulinum was discovered towards the end of the 19th century by Professor Emile van Ermengem at the University of Ghent. A group of Belgian musicians had contracted botulism after performing at a funeral and eating smoked ham. Oh, three no. Of the music- <laughs> yeah. Well, three of the musicians died, oh, and no. their organs, <laughs> along with the smoked ham, were sent to Ermengem for his bacterial expertise. How many musicians, three of them died, how many got sick with botulism? <laughs> what? This is not where I thought this question yeah, was going to go. Yeah, I was going to be like, how few grams of botulism can it be and uh-huh. you still die? No. Give me a number of musicians. How many How many musicians do you need at a funeral is the real question. <laughs> yeah. I would think three would be plenty, <laughs> but. Maybe it was a funeral for a really rich guy and it was like a full orchestra because this was back in the day. but. How many the hams couldn't have all been bad because it didn't say it just one ham. So how many hams can a full orchestra eat? I think a full orchestra could eat <laughs> seven hams. So what's seven divided by fifty? Uh, <laughs> how many people are in a full orchestra? Fifty. What's seven divided by fifty? Okay, I'm you could real. have just said how <laughs> many people can one ham feed. It would have been a would have been a a, a, a more direct path to the same area. Like eight. 50 divided, 56 divided Hank, by leave seven. leave me alone. Sorry, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> seven. <laughs> it's the answer is seven. 7.14. So how many musicians got six? 7.14 musicians. <laughs> and three of them died. One person just got a little bit. <clears throat> little yeah. pukey. I think Belgian musicians love to smoke ham. So I think everyone is in on the ham. I think well, everyone's 20. in on the ham. Okay, okay, okay. I think I think all the ham was bad. I think they were all going ham for the ham, and <laughs> then and they put all the ham in a big thing and they mixed it all up so you don't know which yeah. ham is which. Okay. Yeah, they just had a big ham platter. Everyone was grabbing yeah. from who knows what. Uh huh. So I think twenty of them got sick. The answer is thirty four. Oh my <gasps> god, that's horrible. <laughs> so I don't know how, but it was definitely more than one ham, unless they were all having very small bites. Uh, <laughs> They're clearly... passing the ham around. <laughs> take, a, take a lick. Take a lick. Everybody, take a lick. Mm-hmm. Uh, that sucks. So yeah. All right. So Sarah, that means you get to go first or not, whichever you want. I'll go first. I'll I'll dive into the the ham, the smoked ham abyss. Uh, <laughs> ants are tidy critters, as we've talked about on this podcast before. Maybe me. I talk about ants a lot. I think, but they can't go to the grocery store and buy some soap or disinfecting wipes like we can. So instead, they have to rely on a hyper-local organic cleaning product, poison brewed in their own butts. Oh, uh, no. More precisely, the backmost butt segment of an ant's body is called the gaster, and certain subfamilies use a multi-purpose hole called an acidopore at the tip of their gaster to spray a toxic substance as a weapon or a defense mechanism. And this hole also connects to the anus and the pheromone gland, in case you were curious. So three-purpose <laughs> hole. Cool. Scientists have analyzed these poisons and noticed that a major component of them is formic acid, which makes sense because uh, formica is Latin for ant, which can be corrosive to lots of things from human eyes and skin to bacterial membranes or even rival ants. But they're not just spraying creatures they don't like. This is a multi-purpose poison. The species Lassius neglectus has been observed spraying poison inside their nests or any nest boxes created experimentally, including on their larvae, to kill off pathogens like bacteria or fungi. And no, they are not worried about this disinfectant acid burning their soft, fragile little babies because, as a 2018 paper showed, this species' larvae are swaddled in silk cocoons that act as protection. Sometimes these ants also suck poison straight into their mouths from their acidopores and groom the cocoons to remove any pesky fungal spores. And in a 2020 study, another species called Camptonotus floridinus was observed gargling and or swallowing their own poison after eating food or drinking water, basically 
trying to kill any pathogens before they can fester and multiply in their little tummies. Across these projects, there are various experimental ways to prevent the ants from spreading their poison to see what happened, such as super gluing parts of their bodies shut or making them really Mm. cold so they'd stop moving, which is a little sad. But whenever the ants couldn't disinfect with their poison, they had lower survival rates. So we think Mm. it actually does something. It wasn't just that their butts were super glued shut? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like that might also go on my survival rate. (laughs) You know? Yeah, your butt and jaw super glued shut, but... You never know. We think it's mm-hmm. the, we think it's the disinfectant because we use toxic substances to clean all the time, and like even our immune system uses destroying particles sometimes. So it makes sense that plenty of non-human animals do too. And I guess in nature, mildly poisoning yourself is worth it if it means you stay alive longer. Wow, Windex ants! I got really distracted wondering one question: What is the hole with yeah. the m- most uses? The most. Is three the most? <laughs> you mean you mean of any of any animal? Yeah. Oh, that, I feel like I it's that, a. Ch- that's, we're just gonna cloaca? put that one out there because I don't think oh, yeah. that we're gonna have an answer to that question. No. That's definitely right. So I'm gonna uh-huh. toss it out to the audience. What's the hole with the most uses? Yes. Sam wants to know at Sideshow Tangents. On Twitter, <laughs> yeah, tell maybe, me. Maybe <laughs> if Twitter. <exists. laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. All right, wild, Sari. That's very weird. Sam, what do you got? <laughs> Sari and Hank, let me teach you a little something about viruses. And if I'm wrong at any point, please tell me, because this was really hard. When you're a virus, you sort of have to pick whether you're going to go after cells with nuclei or cells without nuclei. True so far? And you're pretty much locked into that choice. Like you want to infect a bacteria? Well, you, my friend, are a bacteriophage, and you aren't going to be able to go after cells with nuclei, like, say, maybe spider cells. And sometimes when you're a virus multiplying in cells, you tend to pick up things in those cells like DNA. Like, let's say that you're a bacteriophage. You probably got some bacteria DNA floating around in you on account of all the bacteria that you infect. But assumedly, you couldn't have any spider DNA, right? Yeah. Am I right so far? Okay. Yeah, if you're a bacteriophage, I know no reason to have some spider DNA in you. Ah, but what do we do when we assume, my friends? You see, <laughs> in 2016, researchers <laughs> at Vanderbilt who are sequencing the genome of a bacteriophage called WO found DNA that matches DNA that black widows use to make a toxin in their venom. But what the heck? If these viruses only target bacteria, how did it get spider DNA inside of it? WO's target is a bacteria called Wolbachia, and Wolbachia infects arthropods like black widows. And when it infects arthropods, it hides inside cell membranes, safe and sound from bacteria pages. And similar to a virus, as a bacteria is doing all that slipping in and out of cells, it's going to get some junk stuck to it along the way, including DNA from its arthropod hosts. And as previously mentioned, viruses end up with DNA in them too, and they don't care if that DNA comes from a bacteria or a black widow. So now you've got a bacteriophage with black widow toxin DNA, uh, which is what they found, and it's the first time that animal DNA has ever been found in a bacteriophage. So scientists aren't totally sure if these viruses use the toxin, but the toxin makes holes in cell membranes, and these viruses do have to get inside of arthropod cell membranes to get to Wolbachia. So it seems sort of like they do use it. Mm. And in this case, I think the toxin would be considered a poison, thus validating this as a poison fact. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also a bit of a chicken and an egg situation here that scientists are also looking into. Did the bacteriophage get the ability to make cell damaging poison from the spider DNA mm-hmm. passed to it from a bacteria? Or did spiders get the ability to make cell damaging venom from bacteriophage DNA <sighs> passed to it from a bacteria. Nobody knows, obviously. Those, but there are only those two options, so it's one of those yeah. two, and either one is very cool. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And WO also contains DNA sequences that are used in animal cells to sense pathogens and trigger cell death and avoid immune responses. So while it's way more likely that this virus has just collected a bunch of junk over the eons, it and other mm-hmm. viruses like it might have taught ourselves a lot of tricks that make life possible. Sarah. I have a question for you, which is which way is cooler for it to mm. get this DNA? Is it cooler for the for the spider to have gotten a toxin from a bacteriophage? Or is it cooler for the bacteriophage to have gotten it from a bacteria that got it from the spider? I think 
spider from bacteria phage is cooler yeah. because yeah, then spiders were just a- harmless at one yeah. point. And then well, <laughs> I think they had more <laughs> than just that one toxin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like that it got it from the spider because it couldn't get it directly mm. from the spider. It would have to get it from the bacteria that comes right. from the spider. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is wild for genes to just be like, we <laughs> I'll go wherever. <laughs> well now I have to choose which is the weird cooler, weirder fact. And Sari's got a point is a point ahead already. Will it be? Ants disinfecting their whole situation with their butt poison, <laughs> including their insides and their outsides and their nests. Or researchers finding spider DNA in a bacteriophage. But how? Mm, these are both very good. I think that Sari's going to pull away from this one, but only because she came into it with the lead. These points, those points used to not mean anything. I'm offended that they're well, they're a tiebreaker. <laughs> they're really a tiebreaker. Is what they're. You there used for. to give us like 400 points arbitrarily for our facts. You've changed. <laughs> well, look, Sam, you got 400, and Sari got 400, oh, and oh, she got 401. But, oh shoot! Okay. Yeah. Cha-ching. <laughs> But it gets 400. All right. Now it's time to ask the science couch where we've got a listener question for our couch of finally home time to the Jan Rhett Sammy's on Discord and Emily Nidebala on YouTube ask, is there poisonous venom? I mean, if you put it in your blood, if you put it in your interstitial tissues and it's doing damage, if you put it in your tummy, it's very likely to also do damage. I'm sure that there are venoms that aren't poisonous that like you're like in the yeah. acidic environment of your stomach, they'd be pretty in- immediately inactivated, but there's okay. gotta be lots that you wouldn't want to put very much of in you. And also, as I said in the poem, you have enough of anything. <laughs> it's going to get you un- yeah. uncomfortable. Did that make sense, Sari? How did I do? The, the message of SciShow Tangents is do not drink venom. Do not eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Just um, go to one of those like places where they make anti-venom and they're constantly milking snakes and take a shot. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Please. That's rude. Yeah. But if you want to get really, really technical about it, venom, because it goes into your bloodstream, that's more e- an easier distribution pathway. <clears throat> so venoms often contain big proteins that can right. get denatured mm-hmm. um, if you and and proteins getting denatured is just when there's enough heat or a molecular reaction for some reason then they unfold and then they can't do the thing so a toxic protein would no longer be toxic and mess with your cells and, and mm-hmm. be the poison anymore venoms do have different toxicity whether you inject them or you take them orally and researchers do look into this, mostly on mice. It's always mice mm-hmm. of injecting things versus feeding mm-hmm. them to them and mm-hmm. to, to test. And the main thing is that we just don't have, we don't, we don't really test venoms, like eating a lot of different types of venoms. But when we do, there are like a couple things we've learned. And so that's, that's what I found. Um, they, one, one study tested 17 different snake venoms um, just to see whether you could heat them and denature the proteins. And all but five of the 17, so 12 of them after heating, lost basically all of their activity. Mm. So they're just foil. That's just protein. Yeah. That's like eating a steak. And it's just, <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but uh, <laughs> say it's like um, some dirty water, maybe. <laughs> not something particularly nutritious either but there are certain beverages that uh (laughs) integrate (laughs) venom inside them so like snake wine is prepared by steeping a whole venomous snake uh in rice wine and there has been at least one person who was admitted to the hospital because his blood stopped clotting after drinking snake wine. Other people have emerged from it um, anecdotally fine. I was looking at lab protocols and it seems like 70% ethanol is the standard cleaning supply for any toxin venom waste. So I would say if you're making alcohol out of venom, I would make it at least uh, 70% ABV, which I don't think wine is. Necessarily, no, I don't think so. Uh, no, you would no. want like a, a distilled grain 
and then submerge your snake in it. <laughs> yeah. And then you can say you've drunk You can make venom. snake ever clear, but you cannot make snake wine. I yeah, but it sounds like it's going to cause a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. It sounds bad. It sounds yeah. everything sounds bad, but mm-hmm. like high enough concentrations of ethanol might help denature the proteins. Like that's that's the idea yeah. too. Also, would take care of any bacteria that might be growing. Which yeah, I don't like the idea of. And then the only other fact I have is that te- tetrodotoxin, which is mostly known for puffer fish. So if you eat poorly prepared puffer fish, where the the gland that contains the tetrodotoxin has been mm. severed and leaks into the rest of the flesh, then you will be poisoned. But tetrodotoxin is also used as a venom by other species. And so there are, biologically speaking, some species that use the exact same compound as a venom and a poison, depending on where you look in the animal kingdom. So yes, even without drinking snake venom, there is poisonous venom out there because they're all toxins. They all fall under the same umbrella and Some animals just deliver the same toxin in a different way. Cool. Well, if you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to Broken Thumbs on Discord and at Reality Minus 3 and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like the show and you want to help us out, it's really easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow tangents and become a patron. You get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes. And we have a tier where you can get a special in-episode shout-out, which is the tier that patron John Pollock subscribed at. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's super helpful and it helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell people, tell people about, about us. About us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our editor is Seth Glixman. Our story editor is Alan Spillo. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Devoki Trakavardi. Our sound design is by Joseph Kuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmaster and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire. But one more thing. Goats can eat plants like poison oak without being harmed by the urushiol oils that can cause horrible rashes on humans. And surprisingly, it doesn't seem like researchers know how goats protect themselves, like if there are proteins in their spit that help. But an article from 1992 found that in goats that were only fed poison oak for 10 days, over 90% of the urushiol from the leaves was absorbed or broken down during digestion, leaving less than 9% of it in their poop and none in their milk or pee. So if you use goats for landscaping, there's probably no need to worry about poison poop. But don't roll around in it anyway, please. <laughs> I mean, that's still like 9%. Seems like it's plenty. Yeah. Uh, if you, if it's like it... exclusively Yerushial eating. Where is it going? It's not in their milk or their pee, and you can eat goats. What's going well, on it's here? Pro- it's probably turned into different mal- It's broken down chemically. Okay, okay. They're not storing it up in some kind of sack or something. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, that'd be great, though. (laughs) That's how the African crested rat would do it. Yeah. Just have a big Yerushiol sack and it would spray it on predators. And I'd have it on my shoulder and I'd get it to do it to people who are rude (laughs) to me at the grocery store. Yeah. (laughs) Don't let goats and them rats meet each other or else they'll start getting ideas. Yeah, they'll whisper to each other. (laughs) (laughs) Transfer some genes and we'll all be in lots of trouble. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm.